Well, thank you, everyone, and uh, especially you, Susan, and ITIDR for um, the opportunity to be here. This is only my second visit to India. Uh, I was in Delhi about four years ago, and it's wonderful to be here in Mumbai. Uh, my paper really follows on very well from Randall's, I think. Uh, I'm looking at shareholder power, rights, and activism. And I think that's a topic that is of enormous international interest. Uh, it is of interest. That's not where I want to be. There we go. That's where I want to be. Um, so it's of enormous current interest, certainly in many countries around the world and also in India, uh, for reasons that Susan talked about. I, I think from the 1990s, the retreat from central government control uh, to other mechanisms of corporate governance. We saw this morning that uh, shareholders usually vote in favour of management resolutions in India, but not always anymore. We saw that at Tata in 2014 with the executive compensation vote there. So in 2015, I uh, edited a book with Randall, and we have the picture uh, of the cover. That's just in case you ever encounter this book in your bookshop. It's a great read. Uh, we didn't write most of it. Uh, there's about 25 or 30 chapters from uh, very eminent international scholars. And I became extremely interested as I was editing this book in the idea uh, of how different the perception of shareholder power and shareholder participation and shareholder activism is in some countries in the world compared to the US. And so, for example, in some countries um, such as the UK, uh, I would say my own country, Australia, also India, there has been real encouragement of greater shareholder participation in corporate governance, that this is a positive attribute. Uh, in the US, however, I think there is widespread apprehension about greater shareholder participation. And so in this paper, I wanted to understand why there was this divergence in attitude towards shareholders. And in doing that, I was looking at the distinction between shareholder protection, which I think the US is quite comfortable with, versus shareholder participation, which I think the US is extremely uncomfortable with, and also going back to legal history and legal origins to try to understand why the US might be behaving differently. So um, different images of shareholders have existed across time and across jurisdictions in law. Um, we're all very familiar, the lawyers in the room will be very familiar with the US uh, Burley and Means image of the shareholder from the early 20th century of having no power, being completely powerless and at the mercy of corporate management. Now, economic and legal power are distinct items, but they interact. Uh, we saw this morning in Elizabeth's presentation that if you've got a lot of economic power, you can lobby for either more legal rights or less stringent legal regulation. Um, but they're still quite distinct. And you can have legal power uh, and then still not be activists. So some shareholders in jurisdictions such as Japan have tremendous legal power, they just don't use it. So all these are quite distinct uh, concepts. The regulatory spectrum of how we, we regulate corporate governance uh, really is quite dependent on power, I think, because you have regulatory strategies uh, which are all about protection. And so the classic one there is fiduciary duties. The law imposes this on directors. It assumes that shareholders can't protect themselves and that therefore the courts will protect shareholders via fiduciary duties. On the other hand, you have governance strategies, and they're all about giving shareholders stronger powers to protect their own interests. And that's what we've seen a lot more of in recent times. As Randall mentioned, uh, shareholder empowerment is context specific. So in dispersed uh, shareholding jurisdictions, such as the US traditionally was, shareholder power is a counterbalance to managerial or board power. However, in jurisdictions that already have concentrated ownership, either via a controlling shareholder, such as family-controlled companies, or the state-owned companies, 
uh, it can be quite irrelevant. Shareholder power can be irrelevant or even counterproductive of just giving the power holder even more power. We talk about the US with its dispersed ownership structure being different from many concentrated ownership structures in, say, continental Europe or in Asia. But in fact, the US uh, spectrum is changing as well. We've had a major sh shift in the profile of shareholders. So, you know, back in the 1950s, there were only 10% uh, of shareholders were institutional investors. That is now over 70% in the top 1,000 US companies. So that's been a massive rise. It's even more pronounced in the UK. Uh, almost 90% of listed UK equities are held by financial institutions. And interestingly, about half of those are non-UK institutions. And that can have quite a big corporate governance impact. In the US, uh, Ron Gilson and Jeff Gordon uh, have talked about what they term agency capitalism. And they say this new picture presents a new corporate governance paradigm. And in this new corporate governance paradigm of agency capitalism, they talk about the traditional institutional investors who are sophisticated but reticent. And reticent you know, means passive. They weren't and probably still are not prime movers in activism. But what they have shown themselves more and more prepared to do is to tag along with more aggressive uh, investors, such as Randall's hedge funds. And that's changing the picture in the US. So one of the things that got me thinking about these different images worldwide of shareholders and their role in corporate governance was two quite contradictory images that I felt arose out of the global financial crisis. One was this image of institutional investors uh, or shareholders as quasi-regulators or as governance stewards. And so in the UK, for instance, you have the UK Stewardship Code of 2012. Uh, this is now being copied throughout Asia. Japan has introduced a stewardship code. My own country, Australia, has not. Um, SEBI, of course, put pressure on mutual funds to become more engaged in corporate governance in 2010 uh, in India. And I think this really accords with the Gilson-Gordon uh, view of changing modes for institutional investors. But on the other hand, there was a contradictory view of the role of shareholders in the global financial crisis. And that was that they were predators, that they were the ones yanking you know, the chain around the neck of management, prompting them for higher and higher short-term profits. And this idea of shareholders as predators sees them as disloyal agents to their ultimate beneficiaries. And you see that in the writing of even the Chief Justice of the Delaware Supreme Court, uh, Chancellor Leo Strine. I think that comes through in some of his writing. And that is a big shift in corporate law, to view shareholders in that way. Because for most of the history of corporate law scholarship, shareholders have been seen as someone that the law needs to protect. Uh, corporate law has all, always been about protecting shareholders. Whereas now, under this new image, corporate law has done a flip, and it's about protecting the company from shareholders. And that is something quite new quite a different paradigm to in the past. So these divergent images of shareholders have quite different regulatory consequences. I mean, for heaven's sakes, if shareholders are predators, you don't want to give them more rights, do you? Because you'll be pretty confident they will abuse them. On the other hand, if they are a valuable corporate governance mechanism that can stand in place of heavy-handed government regulation, then you'll see them as valuable, and you'll want them to have the sorts of rights where they can, they can affect that change. Those two quite different images of the shareholder, I think, played out in the US just prior to the global financial crisis in the um, US shareholder empowerment debate. And that was all about, do we want to give shareholders stronger powers? Well, the Dodd-Frank Act, 2010, potentially did give shareholders 
stronger powers in one very hot area, and that was proxy access. The ability of some shareholders, qualified shareholders, to put their own nominees for election on the board onto the company's own proxy materials, so that that saved the money, but they could have their choice. Now, at one stage, the Dodd-Frank Act introduced federal laws allowing the SEC to make rules to, to make that happen. And it looked like it had happened. The SEC drew up those rules. And then, in this case, uh, the business roundtable against the SEC, it was torpedoed down. The SEC rules were vacated. Um, the US Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit excoriated the SEC. Uh, it talked about the SEC having introduced these arbitrary and capricious rulemaking, and it blew it apart. The institutional investors, such as CalPERS, wanted the SEC to try again, but the SEC was once burnt, twice shy. It refused to remake the rules. And so what has happened in the US? Well, this very interesting development where the shareholders have taken up the battle for themselves and they have adopted this self-help private ordering to get the rights that they expected to get by federal legislation under Dodd-Frank Act. And so by the end of 2015, a total of 80 US corporations had adopted proxy access rules, either in their charters or their bylaws. And this had rocketed up to 240 by, by mid-2016, and it's still going up. So 39% of all S&P companies had, had done this themselves when federal law failed them. Lots of other changes as well have been occurring, but I just want to focus on these proxy access because that's a really hot button issue in the US today. Now some companies just fell over and did it. Uh, Bank of America, Citigroup, General Electric, once they realized their shareholders wanted these proxy access rules, they put them in the bylaws themselves. Um, others, however, fought back, and this is what I've called private ordering combat. Uh, so the Whole Foods saga in 2015 was an example where the shareholders wanted fairly standard proxy access, reasonably generous to shareholders. Whole Foods said, we're not going to allow them to vote on that because we've got our own resolution that they're going to vote on. And guess what? It was much, much less generous to shareholders they would almost never have been able to satisfy the qualifying um, preconditions for it. Now, that Whole Foods example, I think, is a wonderful example of what Professor Mel Eisenberg in 1989 termed impoverished consent by shareholders, where shareholders are forced to adopt a rule they don't want. But shareholders in the US are really fighting back against this, and it's still happening for example, in H&R Block and Microsoft in 2016. In the paper, I, I finish off, I've got some historical um, background that I'm happy to talk about in the questions, but I'm just going to finish here because I ask in the paper whether there has been a sea change in US corporate governance. And I use Martin Lipton as bellwether in this regard. Martin Lipton has been called, you know, one of the most aggressive anti-shareholder activists. Uh, he has been a warrior against shareholder activists. He takes a no prisoners approach. He thinks that shareholder activists are pure evil. But then in 2015, he started saying nice things about them. So he started talking about try and fund management and it's found in Nelson Peltz. He called them respected members of the financial community. People fell off their chairs. He told corporations that they should meet with these people and listen to what they had to say, because they weren't pure evil after all. And what we found was major investors like BlackRock, uh, Larry Fink in 2016, who had been in the past quite critical of in institutional investor activists, he said that they, at BlackRock, they had supported 39% of activists in the previous year. So, in the paper, I, I point at this out and I say that this is really consistent, I think, with agency capitalism, the Gilson-Gordon point, that the institutional investors, they're, they're reticent, but they don't push activism 
but they join activism when they think it's valuable. And so I think that institutional investors have become the new swing voters of the corporate world. Everyone, even Martin Lipton, is trying to woo them, to get them on side. And so this is you know, going to be something to watch in the future. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jennifer.